Hey everybody, hello. All right, so we're back from lunch, day two. It's been a long, long, uh, not a long day because we're only halfway through, but it's been a long conference. Okay, maybe not a day and a half, but still, I'm tired, I don't know about you. So we're gonna continue and, you know, just a quick recap of what we talked about so far since the morning. We've gone and talked about data literacy, celery, authentication, built the switchboard, Radio, so many things. And then we're going to keep continuing with another female speaker because we need to get more diversity in the industry. And we're going to continue with Gabriella Zarzar. And she's coming from King. I don't know if any of you have heard of King. It's a little company here in Sweden. OK, maybe not little, maybe gigantic. Candy Crush, you've probably all played it. And yeah, Gabriella is going to talk about discovering semantic topics in a collection of documents with open source projects. Yes. So I will pass it to Gabriella, and let's all give her a big round of applause. Thanks. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, everyone. It's a great joy to be here at PyCon for the first time and to be meeting you all. So yes, I am a data scientist at uh, King. I work in the AI Labs team at King. And I have very recently joined King. Uh, I have been working for the last uh, three years at, pa at Peltarion. So Peltarion now, during this summer, perhaps some of you have heard, uh, just got uh, acquired by King. So, uh, so I am now at King. And uh, uh, however, the entire content of this presentation is very much related to work done prior to the acquisition. So work done at Peltarion. So, um, yes, let's, uh, let's start it. So this talk is ultimately about organizing data and organizing data that is pretty much unstructured. And that's the world's data, right? So we have a bunch of data that we ourselves produce, we, are, we humans produce, and that, are, that is supposed to be consumed by ourselves as well. And that is not really inherently, yeah, uh, uh, produced for machines to, to understand it. Um, and um, however, what happens is that pretty much um, machines nowadays, they are pretty much capable of making sense of this unstructured data and organizing these large amounts of uh, unstructured uh, text data in particular, which is what we are going to talk today. We are going to focus on text. Yes, so in this task in the machine learning you know, world, is called topic modeling. So here we are going to talk about uh, finding or discovering topics in a lot of documents. In, you, you have basically a lot of text. And, you, and that's all you have. You don't have anything else. You don't have any kind of guidance or supervision or labels. You have simply a lot of text. And you want to make sense of it. Uh, and so you use topic modeling in order to extract these major topics that are being talked about in these documents uh, of yours. So uh, topic modeling is something that has been there for a while. It's not new. Uh, there are plenty of methods uh, to discover topics in, in text. So the traditional ones, one example of a traditional one is LDA, or Latent Dirichlet um, Allocation. Here, basically, the, the idea is that you interpret your, your documents as a bag of words. You have a you pretty much imagine like a bag and a lot of words that you just throw in it. And, uh, here in LDA, the, the idea is that um, these words, they are 
they have a specific way of being sampled. So you basically sample a topic first, and, uh, and conditioned on that topic, you sample your words. And that is basically a probabilistic, a generative probabilistic um, model. That's LDA, and that can be done to extract topics. However, this is not the arena we are going to be at today. Uh, we are not going to talk about classical methods uh, within topic modeling. We are instead going to talk about neural methods, because we want to harness these complex language representations that are created by neural networks, and in particular by transformer-based uh, neural networks. So this is where we are going to be from now on. We are going to talk about neurotopic modeling. And in order to do, yeah, OK. So before I get into the, the conversation, I just want to say first that this, uh, this conversation does not aim for technical completeness. Uh, this is a brief outline of topic modeling and what you can achieve with it. Um, but with that out of the way, uh, let's get into this. So we are going to start by talking about uh, transformer-based language models. So this is the fundament of everything we are going to do. Then we're going to talk about the method itself. So what is really this that we are doing? Uh, let's unpack the bits, the parts that make uh, neurotopic modeling. Uh, then I'm going to talk about a specific project that we have done at Potarium. And then I will very briefly talk about measuring performance and applications and uh, some caveats and tips and suggested workflow for you to uh, work with um, uh, topic modeling in Python. So let's go, let's start with transformer based uh, language models. So here I, I am, I will talk a little bit deeper about transformers. Uh, we we'll hear a lot about transformers and what they are uh, and what they do, perhaps, is what we, we hear the most about. Here, I would like to, to talk a little bit more about what, what are really transformers. So let's start with, with this. So what do we want at the end of the day is we want a map, something that maps our text into a vector representation whose values encode somehow meaning, semantics, right? We want these values to encode some meaning. And this is what often why we use language models. It's to achieve that. And um, language models, they can really look very different. Um, here, in particular, to give an illustration, I am going to uh, show how a specific transformer-based model called BERT um, works. So um, BERT is a, an abbreviation that means bidirectional encoder representations from transformers. And um, let's get into this. So BERT, it all starts by you have, a, you have a text, right? Text is discrete data. It's basically data that you are going to chop into parts uh, that we typically call tokens. Um, here you can see four tokens, walk, buy, river, and bank. And uh, um, you then, as soon as your data is split in these tokens, into these tokens, you typically want to start by mapping this discrete data into some sort of vector representation for you to do operations on it, right? And that is, that is the input embedding of, of BERT. Uh, and this vector representation, it has basically 768 numbers. Uh, it's basically a pre-trained model that is typically made available by research groups uh, and that everyone can basically use. This is a great achievement in itself, just this mapping, uh, because already going from tokens to um, vector representation, it already encodes some semantics there. So some semantics about walk, about buy, river, and bank. So however, there is a shortcoming uh, related to this, is that you have um, basically a dictionary lookup here. So every single token is mapped to a, 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 a vector 
that is always the same regardless of the context this token is in, regardless of the sentence this token is at. So, so this is an optimal, um, and that's where this mechanism of transformers called attention comes in. So this is where um, attention is, is interesting, is powerful, is to provide us embeddings that are contextual. Okay, so in, in, the se in terms of BERT, this when we say attention uh, in the context of BERT, we are specifically talking about uh, scale dot product uh, self-attention. And if we can look at this now, so what is a scale dot product self-attention? It is, it is really a sequence of vector operations. It's very, very simple vector operations that are just very well placed. And we can look at them. What are these vector operations? So basically, we have these input embeddings there in the beginning that I just showed in the previous slide. And we start by uh, linearly projecting these input embeddings uh, on using three different um, matrices to project them. So we have, and, and basically when I say about these projections, I'm talking about parameters that are actually learned during the training of these, of these models. So uh, we basically project the input embeddings in, in three different directions in this vector space that you can interpret as different semantic directions uh, in the vector space, right? And they have a name here, it's queries, keys, and values. And after you do that, there is basically a scalar product happening on the pairs of, of vectors of, the query, of queries and keys. And basically, when they correlate or when they align, they basically they are similar, and the scalar product is larger. When they are dissimilar, it's lower. So this is a number that is also going to be scaled so that we avoid numerical issues. And but that's it, it's, it's basically a scalar product. And after that, there is an activation, a so-called softmax activation, to basically take these numbers in the columns of the, uh, of the scalar product matrix uh, to uh, basically scale them and to normalize them so that their sum equals to one. And that is the softmax. That is the only nonlinear operation that happens here in the uh, in the entire attention uh, mechanism. And after that, you basically have your contextualized embeddings because you do a linear combination of the vectors in the values and the uh, scores in the softmax. So you basically combine all your vectors in the values in proportions given by the softmax scores. And voila, you have basically uh, your embeddings all uh, mixed, summed up together, and weighted according to the so softmax scores. And that's your contextualized embedding. So you have one for every single token that you presented to the model in the beginning. This is attention. And uh, here, um, well, this is one part of attention, so there is a little bit more to this, which is that these projections, they can happen many times. And that's what we would call the different heads of attention. So you can imagine this sort of being repeated in planes parallel to the screen. And these would be different heads, and they would be focusing on different uh, areas of the vector space. The different projections of the different heads would be focusing on different semantic directions in the vector space. And that's it. This is your multi-head attention. So. Um, this operation, as you can imagine, happens many times, right? We have different layers. This is one layer. And in, in the case of BERT, this happens like 12 times in 12 layers. And, uh, and basically, um, this is how it operates. And there are many similarities with other transformer-based models as well. So, um, and at the end, uh, you, you basically have, um, yeah, a 768 embedding vector for every single token, and it, it is contextualized. So what, what do we achieve with this? We, we achieve complex language representations. Um, here, for instance, is one example. 
we have basically a relation between neighbors and the pronoun that is referring to it, they, because of that softmax score that attention uh, provides, that basically detects this, um, uh, this relation between these parts of the, of the given sentence. And, of course, we also uh, achieve um, embeddings that are contextualized. So you can see here, open a bank account and how is a river bank formed. These are two completely different contexts for the same word, but the embeddings, they are, yeah, they are customized, they are context dependent. They are not the same. And that's great. That's really suited for language understanding and also for topic modeling, which is what we are doing today. So what, how do we do this? So yeah, how do we use this uh, transformer-based language model? So let's go into the method. So in particular, we are doing neurotopic modeling, as I mentioned. And here we are doing with a class-based TF-IDF uh, topic representation. We will get into this. So first, you have your documents, right? And when I say document, this might look different for different applications, like perhaps you want to explore support tickets uh, in your support desk, and basically a support ticket is a document. Uh, perhaps you interpret document as a paragraph in reports that, that you have. Uh, perhaps you interpret documents as a Twitter post, that's a document. So it can have different granularities and different interpretations depending on the application, right? But as, as long as you have your documents, um, you can then embed them. So you can basically convert these documents into a vector uh, representation. In Python, this uh, can be done using sentence transformers. This is the first logo here that you can see, the blue one. Uh, this is a very useful uh, package for uh, working with transformer models that are supposed to be used for clustering and for semantic search, which is really on spot for topic modeling. This is exactly what we want to do. And sentence transformers, they are, they are built on top of PyTorch and on top of transformers from Hugging Face. And you can, yeah, and basically here, the model I'm going to use, I am taking it from sentence transformers. I could also take it directly from Hugging Face uh, model hub. It's also available there. And basically, the output is a vector, right? For every single document, I have a vector representation. So what follows is that we want to do uh, dimensionality reduction, and we also want to cluster. The dimensionality reduction is basically a preparation for the clustering so that we don't feed the clustering algorithm with a, just a lot, very large uh, representations. Um, in particular, we are using here a specific um, nonlinear dimensionality reduction algorithm called UMAP and a density-based um, clustering algorithm called H HDB scan. And there are these are the there are Python packages for both of them. And basically, um, after doing that, we need to describe the topics, because the clusters that we get, they are basically the topics, right? We have documents in groups, and we can call, okay, these, are, these groups are the topics I have discovered, but having them only clustered is not really so informative, so we need to somehow give a description to these clusters so that we can make use of these topics, or so that we can interpret these topics. And how do we do that? We basically uh, calculate words that describe these groups. And, uh, and, and in order to do that, uh, we use a class-based TF-IDF, which is, it's a numerical, so TF-IDF, it's a numerical uh, statistic that basically um, calculates the importance of a word in a group of words, in, in, in a group of words. And here, the group of words that we are talking about is the topic itself. So what is, what, are, what is the set of words that describes that topic, that are unique enough for, to describe that topic? And, and then we have our topics. This is our topic, topic discovery. So there are different packages here involved, right? In fact, 
you don't need to pip, insta pip install all of them to be able to play around with this. Uh, you can basically pip install bird topic. And um, this is an open source um, project that is really, really great for neurotopic modeling. Uh, you can do all of that, what I just described, uh, using bird topic. So how does this work in practice? So bird topic really abstracts away much of the complexity. Um, here, there are very, very few lines of code uh, to basically create your topic model and extract your topics under this topics variable here. Uh, yeah, basically what I am providing is that the language of my documents is Swedish. Uh, the use case I will talk about very soon is uh, for Swedish language. And, and that's basically it. It has a bunch of defaults, uh, basically stating that it's Swedish, then it will automatically look for a model that is multilingual, um, that is able to uh, make sense of, of uh, multiple languages, including Swedish. Um, and you can basically get your topics and start exploring just with these very, very few lines of code. Uh, but uh, the components can also be defined by yourself, right? And um, here, for this particular um, uh, use case or project I'm going to talk about, this is basically the, the code that I use to get this topic model. Um, here I start with, yeah, getting my data. Then I have, I, I basically um, define what is the sentence transformer that I want to use to embed my documents. And in particular to this application, I am using uh, sentence bird Swedish case. This is in fact um, uh, uh, a model that was developed by the National Library of Sweden. Is there anyone from the National Library of Sweden here? No? No. Um, yeah, it's a great model de developed by the National Library of Sweden. It's actually also available in the Hugging Face uh, Model Hub. There is a lot of information here about the model, and the no yeah, there is a blog as well that the, that the KB Lab uh, people uh, wrote. Um, it's, it's a great model. They, they actually started off from a pre-trained, completely English model. And, um, and, uh, and basically trained their own bilingual model, so both Swedish and English um, model, uh, using this uh, monolingual model as a starting point. And uh, for that, they used a technique called the knowledge distillation, and they used a parallel uh, corpus that has uh, basically text on Swedish and, on, and in English uh, translated, so parallel in the sense that they, they knew exactly what was the right mapping, right? And uh, this is how the sentence bird Swedish case was, uh, was trained, and uh, that's the one that I am using here to extract um, embeddings. So, um, yes, so here uh, I am also uh, explicitly defining the arguments that I want to be used for my uh, UMAP, um, dimensionality reduction, reduction algorithm. Also for my clustering algorithm, I am explicitly saying what are the arguments that I want there. And um, when it comes to describing the topics using TF-IDF, there are a few things that one can do as well, such as you can provide your list of stop words or words that you know are not really carrying any kind of interesting meaning, such as prepositions, conjugations, things like. I it even added a few others to the like list that I got imported, uh, like ja, nej, delvis, dels, like these are words that don't mean much. So I can basically inform that this is not like things that describe topics, so I don't want these things to be used. And um, uh, and basically, uh, and basically, I have this count vectorizer here, which is what I need to calculate the numerical statistic, um, which is TF-IDF. All right, all of that is fed to my bird topic, um, uh, to my topic model, and I can basically fit uh, my data and get my topics uh, on the last line. So it's really, it's really simple. 
So how does that look uh, for this particular use case? So if we look, this is this was we partnered with the with a public agency here in Sweden called Tillväxtverket, or the Swedish Agency for Economic and Regional Growth. So Tillväxtverket they receive reports yearly from all the regions in Sweden, and uh, these reports they basically contain information about how the regions are doing uh, in terms of uh, how their regional work is doing in, in terms of different areas, like innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, competence supply, uh, collaboration, both internationally, but also among the regions and the municipalities. So there is a lot of content in this yearly report that they get from the different regions. In particular, we took the reports from 2020 and we did a topic modeling analysis on this, on this data. Uh, this work, um, is part of a bigger project we, we were participating, uh, which is Vinova funded, uh, and it's called Language Models for Swedish Government Authorities. Um, and these reports that uh, Tilvexverket uh, received from the regions, they look like this. So this is an example of one report. Um, so a lot of information, both in text as in tables as well, a lot of text about various focus areas. Um, so the purpose was to offer them a summarized version of what these reports are about before any administrator go in and reads the entire thing and needs to yeah, go through all of this text to understand what they are about. So. Uh, when we did this, uh, basically using that code that I just showed, um, we extracted topics. So here we can see the top seven main topics, and by main topics I mean the in terms of volume, right? Like what is most being talked about uh, in the reports. So here, the first one, for instance, we can see the list of words that are the most descriptive of, uh, of these topics. Um, First one being traffic verket, and then reason the collective traffic, whole part and transport infrastructure. So uh, bear with my Swedish. <laughs> uh, here the the trans transportation is basically what this is being talked about, right? If we can translate this uh, to English, uh, this is a topic about transportation. The second topic here is pandemic, right? Pandemic, pandemics, COVID, pandemic and effect. So these are the most um, describing words, uh, yeah, significant words for these uh, for the second topic. Uh, then we go on, and this one here we can call it hospitality industry, uh, while the fourth one we can call equality. The then funds. It's also talked about in the reports, food and um, cooperation. So um, let's look at a little bit more um, things in the in this notebook. So over here, um, basically what I have here in this notebook is I am basically loading my bird topic um, model that I that I trained and that I saved. I'm using bird topic for that. I am also loading my data, that's texts, and the name of my regions, which are the, the different regions that send in reports. So, and from now on, all the functions you're gonna see are basically functions implemented in the bird topic uh, package. So you don't need to implement that yourself. Um, this is basically a visualiza visualization of the most uh, popular topics. Um, oh, let me go back. Uh, yeah, so this is basically a visualization of the most pop popular topics, and this is what we have seen in the um, in the slide before. Let me, see, let me see if I can scroll down. Yeah, cool. So um, here, another thing that uh, is also useful is to aggregate these these into, into groups, right? Into uh, classes or regions uh, in this case. So we want to see perhaps what are the regions talking about. So here on the vertical axis, you can see 
um, the name of the regions. Oh, let me see if I can scroll. Ah, now I can scroll. No, no. So um, yeah, so here you can see the the different the different regions. Uh, and here are the topics. So the first one being transport transportation. As we talked, we can see also yeah how much is being talked about uh, the pandemic uh, and the hospitality industry. Uh, how much is talk is being talked about? For instance, Gotland has talked a lot about hospitality industry, and we can even see what are the specific words that that are describing this topic for Gotland, for the Gotland region as well, and so on. So this is this is a much friendlier way of actually navigating the content of these reports without needing to read the entire content and make sure make sense of the entire. Uh, thing, right? So, so that's the idea here with with this, and we can also see these um, these topics in in 2D. So, these TF IDF representations that can be reduced for a 2D, um, yeah, flat um, space. Uh, here we can navigate through the different topics and see where they are in this space. Uh, for instance, if we go here to topic zero, the transportation one and we look at a very similar one that is very close. Um, this one is described by words such as like fossil-free, fossil-independent uh, emissions. These are things that are deemed close to the transportation uh, topic um, and that, are, yeah, it, that can be seen here in this visualization as well. But as you can see, there are many topics actually. There are like 300 topics, right, that were um, that were um, detected. Um, perhaps this is this makes sense for the application. Perhaps not. Uh, this is there is an extra visualization that I find very useful, which is this hierarchical. Ah, oh, sorry, I'm having a hard time to scroll down. Yeah, no. So there is this um, hierarchical clustering. So basically, every row here is a topic, and you can see how they relate, and you can basically navigate through them and see the, the descriptive words and basically decide, oh, actually, this node here is enough. Everything else under this node you know, can be merged into a topic. We can, we can just reduce the number of these topics and, um, and perhaps increase diversity in our topics because that makes sense for my application. So it's a, it's a nice visualization. And there are many others in the BERT topic um, package that you can use too. Yeah, explore your data, explore your topics. Um, cool. So if we go back, um, um, yes, one another thing I would like to simply mention is that here, uh, both in this project and in other projects we've had at Peltarion, uh, we've found Streamly to be extremely useful to share results, to basically create web apps that are quickly shareable, that just are in plain Python, that don't need any kind of uh, front-end work uh, for them to exist. And um, uh, Streamly has been a very, very good uh, tool for that, to basically share with the stakeholders the results and hear their feedback and iterate fast. Um, Gradio, I haven't uh, uh, tried it yet, uh, but it was it was a great presentation before on Gradio. I, I will try it out uh, and see how that works as well. Yeah, so this is this concludes our project on topic modeling. Um, a very brief uh, note on the um, on measuring performance. So. In short, it is not trivial to ma to evaluate a topic model. Basically, here we don't have a means to a, a guidance, right? Like we don't have labels, we don't have any kind of supervision. Uh, uh, we have a bunch of text, and we are uh, exploring topics here. Uh, so it's not it's not trivial to evaluate, but there are very useful metrics in this process, and I sort of grouped them here in these three groups. So coherence metrics are those that basically evaluate how interpretable a topic is to a human being. So here, um, 
you can see how, um, how the most similar the words that describe that topic are, the most coherent the topic is. So you want your topics to be coherent. You don't want it to be a mix of a bunch of things, right? You want it to be clean. So coherence metrics are good to check. Then the other one is diversity. You want your different topics to be different, right? You don't want them to be to, to um, uh, repeat one another. So you basically want them different. And a very simple uh, diversity metric, for instance, is to measure the proportion of unique words that you have in your top K words describing your topics. Uh, if they are very unique, that's pretty diverse. Uh, if they overlap a lot, then you are going to hurt this metric, right? So yeah, that's diversity. And similarity metrics, they are kind of connected with diversity as well. You can see how similar your, your topics are to one another. And um, yeah, that can be, there are also a set of, of ways of implementing these metrics. Actually, there is, in my last slide, I have a mention to a very good um, uh, Python project that has all of these metrics uh, implemented already and that, yeah, you can use in your, in your own projects. Yes, so now that you know what topic modeling is about, what can you do with this? You can, for instance, summarize large amounts of text, like, uh, I just showed uh, for the, the case with Tilvex Vericat. Uh, you can make large volumes of data searchable, right? If you know what these chunks of te text are about, you can look for everything about pandemic in these regions. You can look for everything about um, equality, everything about funds, and just go right into the content. You can follow the, de the development of a concept over time. So perhaps you want to know, yeah, this was 2020 exactly when the pandemic hit. So you want to see uh, how much of pandemic is still lingering in 2000, uh, 2021, 2022, 2023. Uh, how, how much is this talked about? Um, you can also analyze subtopics. So uh, subtopics of a given uh, concept. concept. Um, one example of an application that uh, was done by the uh, Pinecone uh, people, and it's available in their learning center, is an application on Reddit data, basically. So they have been analyzing Reddit, uh, uh, Reddit data extracted using the Reddit API. And here you can see their topics data reduced to a 3D uh, uh, space using UMAP. So here, really, it, it has been the data, the documents have been embedded and the dimensionality reduced. And basically, you can see what are, where are these different groups investing in PyTorch, Python, and language technology. These are major topics um, that were detected over here, but that could already be seen uh, in the data only in three dimensions, uh, just using UMAP. So it's pretty interesting what one can do with just a lot of text and um, using uh, models and packages that are available um, out there. Yeah, this slide is a little bit more King related. So this is work to come. Um, as you know, King uh, produces mobile games. So we have many, many, many games out there. And uh, we have a very strong community forum. So many players uh, write in the community forums and uh, write about their experience with the games, with specific levels, uh, what they find great, what they don't like, uh, what they yeah, praise. They, they talk about different things uh, in the community. And it's pretty much hard to organize the content of this community. So this is something we have in our pipeline, which is use topic modeling in King community data to basically understand what our players are. Um, yeah are talking about. Yes, and to conclude, I, I would like to go first through a few um, caveats. So um, uh, data processing might be necessary, right, depending on the, on the application, um, in case there is significant uh, noise in your data, um, such as HTML tags or whichever kind of, of noise that makes it 
uh, untrivial for a neural network to, to process. Um, there might be some extra work done prior to the embedding of the, of the documents. Um, yes, and this is sort of a, just an attention flag here, is that transformer-based models, they fail short, where high degrees of interpretability and uh, explainability are required. This is a very active research area that is really evolving super, super fast. Um, but I think this is important to, to notice. Um, yeah. Um, what are some tips? So, uh, Julian has already presented the Hugging Face Model Hub, right? Uh, this is a great, great place to browse available transformer models out there. Uh, here, I, w I think he already mentioned this. I am just highlighting a few things. Uh, use the search tool in the Model Hub. It's very, very useful to, to navigate. Uh, read through the model card. Uh, this, is, uh, this is there for us to understand. This is basically a handover of whoever has developed that model to whoever is using that model. So that's the model card. That's the interface. So uh, it's, it's super important to see if that model is a good fit to your application and be especially mindful of uh, the limitations and the biases that uh, may be included in that uh, in that model. And consider the language that are included in your data. So um, English, there is plenty of, uh, of models for English, right? Um, for Swedish, there happens to also be now. Uh, I think in the, in the previous uh, years, we have had quite a lot of development of uh, Swedish-friendly uh, models. Um, and there, in the Hugging Face model, you can uh, see what are the ones that are suitable for Swedish as well, or any language you want to work on. Yeah, and the components in Bertopic. Um, define them. Uh, so the defaults, they are not necessarily suitable for your application, right? Uh, so there is a lot of good material in the Bertopic um, uh, package to, for you to navigate through the different options, and some practical tips over here in this, um, in this link. Yes, and uh, yes, um, this is a suggested workflow, like um, a general workflow that I find useful. So first, start by visualizing your data. So getting to know your data, being familiar with it. Um, then when you're ready to actually start writing like the, the topic model um, uh, code, uh, you, basically, you probably want to tune uh, these parameters uh, manually to just have a sense of how they affect your results, your topic model. Um, and then you perhaps want to use this. Yeah, this is the, the, the package, the Python package I just mentioned before. It's called Octis. And uh, it is basically making it very simple and easy to compare topic models. So there you can find metrics, many quite many metrics that are already implemented and that you can simply use in your application. Um, and yeah, and just be careful about which metrics to optimize for. And uh, the, how your different parameters affect these metrics. So I think then you are set for success with, uh, with topic models. Um, yeah, this is what I, what I got for today. Thank you so much for your attention. All right, amazing. Super cool to see how we can use NLP to help government agencies, how to find yes. topics, tagging, forums. It's like crazy what you can do nowadays. So who has questions for Gabriella? There is, oh, we got a couple, okay. Let's, uh, I'm gonna pass, oh, my coworker. <laughs> Wait, let's, uh, I'm gonna pass it this way. And then we'll pass it down. Yeah. Uh, Super interesting. Thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering about multiple languages. If you have a data source that isn't a bunch of government documents all in one language and you want to be able to take into account multiple languages at a time, is it enough to just specify those languages in that uh, code that you showed where you had Swedish, or is it more involved than that? Mm, yeah. Um, 
Yeah, in case you, you mean in this particular application you are illustrating, then you have different languages, right? Or yeah. multiple languages in the different documents. Yeah, I would recommend to pick an embedding model yourself that is uh, trained on languages that are under your, like, in, in your document. So there are various multilingual models, and these are super easy to find in the Hugging Face uh, Model Hub, for instance. So there you can see the, uh, the multilingual uh, models. Um, and uh, you can perhaps experiment with some of them. There is uh, this one, yeah, this one is the one that I showed, right? The Kobe Lab, yeah. Mm -hmm. That is basically bilingual, so this is like for Swedish and English. Um, this one over here, the paraphrase multilingual mini LM, uh, this is actually, this is suitable for quite many languages. You can see here in this tag, multilingual. Um, yeah, this might, might this could be one possibility for your for your application, but there are many. So perhaps you can you can test a few of them and see what are the what which ones make the most sense for your for your application. So are these multilingual models by default able to look at multiple languages at a time, or do you still have to you know take one model, specify a language one at a time? Uh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> uh, this, so basically here, you can embed uh, text in multiple languages, and the vector space this is trained on, it's, it basically maps whichever language to the same okay. vector space, yeah. Cool. And that's cool. very, very useful, yeah. yeah. So it's the same model that can import, that can be fed with data from multiple languages, and the uh, yeah, it's the same model. It's not different okay, models. Cool. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking in the context for the the King community feedback problem. I assume you get many, many languages. There. Indeed, true, <laughs> true, true. Uh, yeah, oh, we cool. do. Thank you. Very interesting talk, thank you. Uh, I have a question about the dimensionality of the ve vector space. Ca if you can give uh, some kind of examples of what the dimensions might be and uh, what dimensions uh, get projected onto others uh, in the UMAP step and um, what kind of uh, problems this can give you uh, with um, uh, like a cherry picking of data and such when reducing the the dimensionality of the vector space. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So the the um, yeah the dimensions they can vary a lot depending on the. This is model specific, right? So bird, for instance, it gives a 768 long vector. Uh, this one, for instance, is is actually smaller. It's 384 um, numbers. Um, so typically, so. We don't want to feed all of that to that clustering algorithm that we want to to use to separate the the documents. Uh, this is this is basically hard for the for the this, this makes it complicated for the separation. Uh, this is the reason why we use UMAP here. Uh, honestly, this doesn't need to be UMAP really. It could be principal component analysis. It could be TSNE. It could be other algorithms to reduce the, the dimension. Uh, it happens, UMAP happens to have interesting properties to do this, this, this reduction. And typically, it can really be reduced to quite a lot uh, in this application. I just had five numbers describing <laughs> every document, like really five, um, yeah, five dimensional vectors. Um, uh, I have seen applications to like with like three, like very, very small. Um, and it's interesting how, how nicely it can be condensed into, into, into really compact vectors. Um, and um, I think that one can also experiment. This is also a parameter that one can experiment uh, uh, in your own application. But yes, with what I have experienced, like, yeah, around five dimensional uh, vectors have been enough to, um, to separate the topics, yeah. And what kind of uh, 
in concrete terms, what are the uh, what is a sem semantic dimension? What what could it be? Uh, like one of these 384 dimensions. Do you have an example? Yes. So, um, in in fact, this um, it can be anything that has semantic meaning. So, basically, when we have that, if I go back to the um, um, ah, this one here. So. Um, yeah, so if we see these, uh, these projections here, um, so basically the dimensions are degrees of freedom, right? This is like a space for you to just get more information in your, in your vectors and represent uh, them. So um, we can interpret, we can, we can have these I like to interpret these, uh, for instance, these uh, projections that happen here, uh, these linear projections um, that we see here in the attention mechanism in, that we are calling uh, queries, quiz, and keys and values, as really dimensions, like directions in the, in the semantic space. And then you can see how, how these, these vectors really project in the dimension of um, nature in the dimension of prepositions, uh, in the dimension of uh, uh, whatever. So uh, it can be really different things that have some meaning to us. And uh, perhaps, you know, river and bank in this dimension of nature, it will have a strong scalar product there because it has a strong uh, nature call to it. Uh, while by like doesn't really have anything to do with nature, perhaps low low similarity there. So, uh, in fact, these semantic dimensions these are the model is free to define that in order to solve the optimization problem. That is a training. Uh, that is the training, right? Uh, the model is free to define these dimensions. It's really a bit hard for us to exactly interpret. Uh, but this is the, the gist of it. Uh, it's different areas in the vector space that um, have different meanings and that are portrayed in the different attention heads. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah, I think I understand. Thank you very much for your answer. Cool. Hello. Yeah. I have a question. I have two questions, actually. Thank you for the great talk, first of all. Uh, my first question is, when you were uh, showing us their different topics, then there was like top five in every topic, and there were synonyms. So there were uh, the words that mm -hmm. basically have the same lemmas. Mm -hmm. Is there a call? Um, you were talking something about uh, syntax analysis in the beginning, but when you were showing an example of English language, then there were like word by word, there were no synonyms there. I mean, um, can you explain why in Swedish language you basically get uh, the similar words several times with different endings and in English you don't? Mm, that's a great question. Yes, so this is... Um Indeed, there are many, like here in equality, yem stelt hit, yem stelt, yem stelt. Like they are very similar, right? Um, yes, so there are, if you want to have different, um, perhaps very different words there in the top uh, K words to describe these topics, um, you can also, you can do more. Uh, like there in bird topic, there is even function to increase the diversity of the top K words. I haven't, I haven't played around with that, but this is exactly to tackle this issue that many top K words they are, they might be very very similar. Um, so um, this this can be worked on definitely. I haven't, I haven't touched it. I haven't looked into. Um, uh, into increasing diversity there on the lemmas, 
um, but this is this can be done so that you can you have uh, you have words that are more different. And the second question, maybe I'm not connecting. Um, it's like you you are talking about uh, summarization, but at the same time we see topic modeling. Mm -hmm. But this is not a summary of the text for me. Not a meaningful, at least. Yeah. I mean, how do we go from that? into the summarization mm -hmm. of the big text. Yeah, in, within NLP, indeed, there is a task to call text summarization, right? Which, has, which is its own field uh, to summarize text, be it in an abstractive way or an extractive way, right? Uh, this is not text summarization, this is topic modeling, true. And uh, what I mean by summarizing is that um, uh, basically, instead of going through the text, you go through the topics that are talked about in the text. And these are basically... Um, this is a means of navigating through this semantic arena that is in your documents, right? So, um, by, um, by looking into the into this, for instance, and you can see, okay, what is being talked about in the different regions, and I don't need to go and check the text, read all the text to make any, yeah, to, to understand it. Basically, this is a first contact with the content. And... Um, is it similar to keywords, then? I mean, these words that we have as the top words of mm -hmm. the topics, would it be closer to the keywords analysis in an NLP? What is keyword analysis? Uh, really sorry about this, but we have to stop uh, because we have to move on to the next uh, lectures or the next presentations. So, okay. yeah, sorry. <laughs> all right. All but right. maybe you well, can talk. talk about it after. Cool. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thank you. Let's give Gabriela a podcast.